Good evening, thanks for joining us. This is NTD Business, and I'm Paul Graney. The massive ship blocking the Suez Canal is finally free and back on course. Hundreds of vessels start moving again. Investors breathe a sigh of relief, for now at least. It says the forced liquidation of a New York-based fund doesn't upset broader markets. But is there still a risk downstream? And personal bankruptcy rates plummet during the pandemic. What's the reason and will it last? That and much more coming up at NTD Business. If you're waiting on something coming from Egypt, you'll be glad to hear they finally unstuck that big ship on the Suez Canal. The other ships that were patiently waiting on either side are now starting to move. Tugboats there sounding off their horns in jubilation after the huge container ship is freed. The ship was stuck in the mud for almost a week before locals helped get it afloat. A live tracker showed the vehicle being straightened after tugging operations Monday. Canal authorities say around 370 vessels are waiting to travel through the canal. It's one of the busiest waterways in the world with about 15% of the world's shipping traffic passing through it. The stoppage has cost the canal 14 to 15 million dollars a day. Canal Authority's chairman says it could take up to three days for the traffic jam to clear. Shipping group Maersk says the knock-on effects on global shipping could take weeks or even months to unravel. The global computer chip shortage won't be unstuck as easily though. American appliance maker Whirlpool says fridges, microwaves, and other home appliances are the next victims. Entities Phil Zoll reports. Fridges and microwave ovens could be the next victims of the global chip shortage. That's according to one of the world's largest appliance makers. Whirlpool Corp said Monday that it's falling behind on exports to Europe and the U.S. from China. It told Reuters the company's president for China said Whirlpool faced a, quote, perfect storm. It's been unable to get enough of the microcontrollers that sit at the heart of devices like fridges. The shortage began to be a problem in December as lockdown consumers snapped up laptops and other gadgets. Chip makers have since prioritized clients like smartphone makers, who buy more expensive silicon. Car firms were the first victims forced to wait in line for the relatively low-end chips they need. On Monday, Hyundai Motors said it would suspend output at one plant due to a lack of semiconductors. Last week, Honda and General Motors both had to extend existing production cuts. Now it seems appliances are next to suffer and it's not just Whirlpool. One Chinese maker told Reuters Monday that it too had suffered delays due to the shortage. Another said the silicon drought had forced it to test alternative chips to see if they could replace its usual parts. Phil Zhou, NTD News. Stocks were mixed on Monday. The S&P 500 slightly below its record high last week. The Dow rose 98 points, 0.3 percent. S&P 500 lost 3 points, 0.09 percent. The Nasdaq dropped 79 points, 0.6 percent. As I mentioned, bank shares fell with warnings from potential losses from that hedge fund's default on margin calls. More on that just a moment. Boeing rose over 2% today. Southwest said today it'll buy 100 of the new Boeing 737 MAX airplanes. Good news for Boeing. The 10-year Treasury yield rose a little, up to 1.71%. Oil rose and gold fell. Like I mentioned, big banks like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are down today after a a New York-based investment fund was forced to liquidate its holdings because it couldn't make a margin call. Let me explain. It's common for an investment fund to borrow money to buy assets and increase the size of its portfolio. But just like if you borrow money to buy a house but can't make the repayments, the bank will force you to sell the house to pay them back. Same with stocks. If the value of the stocks you're holding as collateral no longer meets the bank's requirements, it will force you to liquidate something to pay them back. This is called being margin called. This time it happened to Bill Huang of Archigo's Capital Management. He couldn't make his margin call, and so at least two major banks say they'll suffer significant losses because of it. There also fears it could cause a domino effect in financial markets and create chaos. But some say it looks to be contained. 
So I asked Lance Roberts at Real Investment Advice. Well, first of all, if you're going to start channeling Ben Bernanke, we're going to have to have a different term here. But <laughs> uh, you remember back in 2007, Ben Bernanke said subprime was contained, right? The problem is we don't know if it's contained. We know right now it seems to be contained to this one particular hedge fund, but that's also what we thought with Bear Stearns. And when Bear Stearns had to liquidate their two hedge funds, we thought the problem was contained. And then we had to liquidate Bear Stearns. We thought the problem was contained. Then we liquidated Lehman. We found out the problem was not contained. That's the issue here is that we don't know really whether it's contained. What causes these problems? Same thing you and I have talked about now for the last several weeks. Interest rates going up too quickly. That affects margin lines, leverage loans, all these types of issues. Also impacts the the value of derivative collateral as well as as functionally uh, debt collateral as well. Changes to inflation rates. We're seeing inflation come up. That's problematic. And of course, we have a highly leveraged, very extended, very exuberant market where all investors are in, in terms of allocation wise, they're about just as invested as they can be at this point. In fact, we have the same leverage of allocations that we saw back in the dot-com bubble um, to equity investments in the market. So we have all the ingredients for a crisis. The problem is we never know what the trigger is that causes the ultimate unwinding of it. Uh huh. Have we seen, as the interest rates came down uh, initially from last year, are people then able to take on additional leverage? Is that how these things work? Yeah, absolutely. The, the cheaper interest rates go, the more I can leverage up, right? I can buy a bigger house than I could last year because interest rates are lower. It, it's the same thing in the financial markets. As long as asset prices go up, my cost of borrowing goes down, I can leverage up more of my, my book. And that's what we've seen happen here. We've seen a lot of leverage being taken on. Uh, on the retail side of the, of the ledger, we have the highest levels of margin debt in history, and that's dangerous um, because at some point, if that becomes a liquidation event, it occurs all across the market. And is there a lot of uh, moral hazard here as well that, as you mentioned, there's all of the, oh, I think we spoke about this before as well, we have all the ingredients of a crisis here. You'd think that a lot of these big banks or these players in the financial system might be extremely probably concerned but when we have this too big to fail mentality if that is there uh, is that there and and kind of prevent a egging on this exuberance do you feel well that's the problem is that moral hazard is the idea that i have an insurance against failure so yeah all the major banks are insured against failure we've done that for 11 years now we're now bailing out investors. Um, investors that invested in the markets lost a, money, a lot of money. We're sending them checks directly to households. So yes, we are definitely creating and have created moral hazard through the entire markets. Ultimately though, that is a false premise because when an unwind occurs for whatever reason, whether it's a, um, a war breaks out between the US and China, or we have a, a currency default issue somewhere in the world or a debt default issue somewhere in the world, whatever it is, never know what it's going to be. But whenever that unexpected event, like a pandemic that leads to an economic shutdown occurs, when that occurs, you can't stop the underwinding of that process. And the idea of having this insurance policy in place is a very warm blanket, but it doesn't last very long when the unwinding starts. Very good, Lance. Really appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. Were you one of the unhappy Twitter users that couldn't tweet this morning? As many as 18,000 reported issues with the site. It's according to Down Detector. Subject to social media with the hashtag Twitter down to complain. One tweet said, taking forever to load tweets on app and website. The outage could have affected more users than reported but now it seems to be up and running again. Visa said today transactions on its network could soon be settled directly using a cryptocurrency. It's called USD coin. It's another boon for crypto fanatics and another step towards mainstream adoption. USD coin's value is pegged to the US dollar unlike some other cryptocurrencies. Visa says it's working with crypto.com. It's a major crypto platform plans to offer the option to more partners later this year. Bitcoin jumped to one week high after the news, rising as much as 4.5% to more than $58,000. Big finance firms including BNY Mellon, BlackRock and MasterCard have all recently taken steps to make more use of cryptocurrencies for both investment and payment purposes. 
Visa says the transactions will be settled over Ethereum. It's one of the most actively used open source blockchains. And German authorities have a new technology to help investors buy and sell securities on blockchain. They've linked security trading to Germany's central bank. In today's Patrick Hayden has the details. German authorities have developed technology allowing investors to buy and sell securities on the blockchain in return for central bank money. Institutions around the world have been experimenting with settling trades in fiat currency with blockchain. Blockchain is a shared digital ledger of transactions that cannot be corrupted. The technology is best known for powering cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. One fintech company CFO says it could make the market more efficient. Um, linking payments directly through to, to position reconciliation uh, it has, has the benefit then of, of, of shortening the time horizon. Um, so having those two things intrinsically linked and happening um, at the same time, again, just very clearly Im- improves the efficiency of, of, of the market and, and specifically for any of the firms that are participating. Jefferson says it will reduce the work for financial institutions to manually reconcile transaction records across different venues, including online exchanges, swap facilities, as well as over-the-phone transactions. Um, So any advance in technology that can shorten that process and improve that process is better for operational risk for the firms involved um, and, and, and potentially allows them to concentrate on the portfolio that they wish to manage and the positions that they wish to manage. One pioneering aspect here is the technology bridges the gap between trading securities and the central bank without the need for a digital euro, something that's also in the pipeline. Jefferson says there are other areas in trade finance that are also starting to see these changes. One of them is the commodities trade. So the physical business of commodities is quite manually intensive, um, still relies on pieces of paper being being taken from, from one party to another. Um, and there are quite a few firms that are doing this, uh, are making quite big strides to improve that efficiency and, and security. During the test in Germany, six banks tested trading government bonds on the blockchain. The German central bank says the technology could be scaled up to the entire eurozone shortly. Patrick Hayden, NTD News, London. Some mom and pop landlords have been forced to sell the rental properties. This is the CDC extends the nationwide eviction ban until the end of June. Some small landlords just aren't getting paid. The ban was expected to expire on Wednesday. It says the moratorium is needed to keep people in their homes and help curb the spread of the CCP virus. The rationale is that evictions would force people into shelters or other crowded conditions. The moratorium only pauses evictions, doesn't relieve tenants from rent or housing payments. The Census Bureau said a March survey showed that around 20% of adult renters said they didn't pay last month's rent. A new survey says the majority of single-family rental homes say they've been negatively impacted by the eviction moratorium. 30% say they'll have to tighten standards for future renters, and 11% have said they have to sell at least one of their properties. But personal bankruptcies actually dropped in 2020 compared to 2019. It's according to Equip data. But experts worry these bankruptcies have simply pushed into the recovery period. Entities Arlene Richards reports. Contrary to predictions, personal bankruptcies plunged in 2020 during the pandemic. The reason? Government aid such as stimulus checks and loan help. A lot of people have been spending less. They've been eligible for forbearance for certain types of debt, like student loan debt has been paused. And then there's also the fact that a lot of courts have been either closed or operating at reduced capacity. Chapter 7 bankruptcies, which are for people unable to pay, dropped 22 percent. And Chapter 13 bankruptcies, for those who can pay under a payment plan, dropped 46 percent. Unless consumers are coming to us for pre-bankruptcy counseling, the federal programs are providing them relief, such as relief with foreclosure prevention, also the moratorium on foreclosures. Foreclosure defense attorneys can attest to the impact of these relief measures. My phone calls are down dramatically. Um, I I mainly deal with foreclosure defense. Uh, I'd say my business is down, my new calls are down about 90% over what they were at the beginning of 2020. Experts say that as the economy recovers, bankruptcy filings are likely to increase. After these moratorium and the evictions are lifted, 
um, that we'll begin to see a, a dramatic pickup in bankruptcies. As employment rises, creditors will chase those wages. But we're far from out of the woods. A lot of those bankruptcies that didn't happen in 2020 may well happen at some point down the road. As government help phases out, many worry there'll be a massive surge in bankruptcies. Arlene Richards, NTD News. The Biden administration is pushing forward on a wind farm project off the coast of New Jersey. It's projected to produce enough energy to power 500,000 homes, but we have no idea how much it will cost yet. The president recognizes that a thriving offshore wind industry will drive new jobs and economic opportunity up and down the Atlantic coast, in the Gulf of Mexico, and in Pacific waters. And it will also generate enough power to meet the demand of more than 10 million American homes and avoid 78 million metric ton tons of carbon emissions. Biden wants offshore wind production to power more than 10 million homes by 2030. Other offshore wind projects in development include the one off the coast of Long Island, New York, and another off the coast of Massachusetts. But fishing groups from Maine to Florida worry that wind projects could make large parts of the ocean off-limits for fishing. And a slap in the face for U.S. sanctions, China and Iran have signed a 25-year agreement to strengthen their alliance. The Chinese regime is expected to invest in Iran's energy and infrastructure sectors. The deal brings Iran into China's Belt and Road Initiative. That's a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure scheme aimed at expanding the Chinese regime's global influence. China is one of Iran's largest trading partners and a long-standing ally. The Chinese regime has often spoken out against U.S. sanctions on Iran, and Iran's foreign minister calls China, quote, a friend for hard times. And China slapped a 176% tariff on another friend, Australia, for Australian wine imports. Beijing accuses Australia of dumping wine on the Chinese market to harm competition, but Australia denies the accusations. In today's Patrick Hayden reports. The world's largest standalone winemaker Treasury Wine Estate said Monday that Beijing imposed a 176% duty rate on its Australian wine imports to China. It's the winemaker's biggest market. To avoid the hefty tariffs, Australia's Treasury Wine Company said it will redirect its sales to the United States, Europe and elsewhere in Asia. The increased rate went into effect Sunday and will last for at least five years. Beijing claims Australia has been dumping its wine on the Chinese market to harm its domestic wine industry. Australia's agriculture minister denies the allegation. He told CNBC Australia doesn't subsidise its farmers. Australian wine is the second highest price point wine in China. Uh, so you don't go and dump a high quality product into, into a market such as China. Beijing's heavy handed action started last year, soon after Australia called for an independent investigation into the origin of the CCP virus, which infuriated Beijing. Australia Trade Minister Dan Tehan says they're looking at the next steps, including taking the matter to the World Trade Organization. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Still to come. Your morning cup of joe might soon cost you more. Coffee supply is at a six-year low in the United States. What's behind the shortage? And cheese sales are flourishing in France. People are looking for a wide variety of cheeses to escape pandemic lockdown gloom. That and more after the break. what a reader writes to best-selling author James Cook about his new book, The Great Gold Comeback, Bankruptcy of the Welfare State. There is no way I could ever properly express my thanks to you for the Gold Comeback book and all that you have written within it. What a real treasure. Get this hard-hitting volume absolutely free. It covers economics, inflation, socialism, welfareism, capitalism, crashes, panics, interventionism, and crisis. Regularly $29. Yours free. Call 1-800-328-1860. 
When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. Trends may be fleeting, but values are timeless. We now bring you this new clothing brand with classic design and luxurious comfort. It's our way of sharing hope and inspiration from the world of Shen Yun. We bring you Shen Yun Dancer. Wear it with honor. In a hopeful sign for the economy, travel sites Airbnb and VRBO are reporting a boom in online reservations. VRBO stands for Vacation Rentals by Owner. It's said to be off to its best start in a quarter century. Shares of rival Airbnb are up more than 20% this year following the company's initial public offering in 2020. Airbnb's hosts have earned a combined $1 billion since the pandemic began last year. Meanwhile, Expedia's stock, which owns VRBO, has soared more than 30%. Analysts believe consumers are now ready to travel and vacation again. Bookings for Travelocity, Orbitz and Hotwire are all starting to bounce back as well. Lockdowns have hurt the tourism industry in San Francisco like everywhere, but starting to recover as well since restrictions ease. Entity's Eileen Eng has more from California. According to one report, San Francisco tourism in 2020 dropped 61 percent compared to 2019. The San Francisco Travel Association predicts that domestic travel will pick up first before appealing to the international market. The city leveled up to the less restrictive orange tier of the state's reopening map. This means many indoor activities like museums, places of worship, movie theaters and restaurants may open at 50 percent capacity. Here at Pier 39 and the Fisherman's Wharf, some of the top attractions in the city, tourism is gaining momentum again as we see more people allowed for indoor and outdoor dining. Small businesses that were struggling are seeing hope again. They had to cut down on employees and hours to break even. We see starting to see more people in, coming down for lunch. We have more uh, people walking in the area. We have more uh, tourists from states and out of state also. So we're getting a little bit more relief, better relief, more uh, customers going around. Another owner said they are doing about a third of what they were doing compared to before the pandemic. They had 35 employees a year ago. Now there are 10. Business is behind that. I see the tour buses go by now and they've got double deckers, they have people on them, which is a good sign. Alcatraz is open. So it seems like things are going to come back. It may take a while. They say they see more domestic tourists than international ones. Doing a road trip right now for spring break for my son. It's his first time, so I brought him up here. But uh, I took advantage of the fact that it's actually empty. There's not many people, and I'm able to explore, you know, walk around without the concerns or worries of having something covering my face. <laughs> I was I don't know what I was really expecting, but it's really nice. I love the ocean. I love it. So it was a fun like last minute trip. Assuming there isn't another virus wave, San Francisco's tourism is expected to continue to gradually recover and may return to pre-pandemic levels by 2023. Eileen Ng, NTD News, San Francisco. Coffee stockpiles have sunk to a six-year low in the United States. Now, the cost of coffee could start to creep up if things don't get better. The deficit is being blamed on a massive shipping container shortage that's made moving anything around the globe more difficult. Brazil had a record-producing year when it comes to coffee beans, but thanks to the pandemic, 
Getting those beans from South America to North America has become extremely difficult. Even if the shipping container situation gets resolved, multiple analysts say they're expecting a global supply deficit, which could lead to increased coffee prices. Some more not so good news. Bloomberg reports supplies of unroasted beans in the U.S. were down over 8% year over year last month. But it seems that the French know how to have a good time even when times are rough. French people are eating more cheese. Since the pandemic began, sales of cheese are up, and Lisa Bernhard has more. One way to beat the lockdown blues? More cheese. That's the French way, at least, as sales in the country soared by more than 8% in 2020, compared with just 2% the year before, with shuttered restaurants leaving French shoppers salivating more than ever for their beloved Brie, Camembert and Roquefort, just to name a few. Véronique richet Larouge is president of France's local cheeses association. The French maintained and even compensated in a way for the lack of sales in restaurants by their high consumption, higher than usual. For example, we see that for goat cheese, consumption is up by 32 percent. Camembert is up 2 percent. Comté is up 8 percent. Raclette, a winter favorite served melted with potatoes and meats, jumped 12 percent. Even sales of mozzarella, a southern Italian cheese, rose by 21 percent. Augustin Denou is owner of a cheese shop in boulogne billancourt France. In our little way, we've helped prevent people from being completely gloomy. There's that moment of pleasure at the dinner table with good wine, good bread and good cheese when you forget everything for an hour. Cheese has even fared better than another traditional French favorite, champagne, in a year bereft of celebrations. Nicolas is a cheese shop regular. This is typically one of the pleasures we still have access to, with an unimaginable diversity just like wine. You only need to see the display here. It takes you on a journey. A broad selection is key, especially with Saturday being France's National Cheese Day. That's the latest business updates for today. You can still catch NTD Evening News with Stephanie Cox at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. But for Entity Business, it's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.